Okay. Or I can just use the arrows or you can there. Use, yes. Okay. No, I think I'm fine. Should I just start? Okay. Am I both on? Good morning. Am I on? Yes? No? All right. Thank you for coming today. I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about some of the charity care obligations and discussions we're having now about tax-exempt hospitals and the maintaining their tax-exempt status. Uh, so I'll talk to you a bit about uh, the issue itself, uh, some of the concerns, what prompted the project when I first started working on it, some recommendations I have uh, about changes we might be able to make here, and a little bit about the current state of affairs and where we might be going in the future. So for those of you who have not been following all the reports on this, and that's probably almost no one in the room, um, we still have a lot of people who do not have insurance or who are underinsured. And despite all of our efforts over the last few years, and in fact, probably over the last few decades, to get more and more people covered, we're seeing increasing numbers of uninsured people and underinsured people. And this is despite the new Affordable Care Act, we're likely to continue to see people who don't have the ability to access care using insurance. So some really significant questions for what we call our safety net hospitals. The uninsured rates themselves vary among the states. These are the um, uninsured rates among non-elderly. Uh, in theory, the vast majority, if not almost all, of our elderly population, or our population over 65, should be covered by Medicare. Um, I don't know what kinds of changes we'll obviously see to the Medicare system. We are having some discussions about things, including raising uh, age to become eligible for Medicare. Um, but we're likely to still see a large majority of our elderly population covered. So we're really usually talking about our populations under the age of eligibility for Medicare. You can see here, so the um, white state uh, are less than 14% uninsured. Uh, the red ones, 14 to 18%, and the blue are greater than 18%. So you actually do see geographical differences uh, in uninsured rates, and then geographical differences in what states are going to bear significant burdens from uninsured populations. One of the interesting things that we've seen in the last few years is that uh, because our system ties insurance to employment, although we are trying to move away from that to a certain degree, when you see a rise in unemployment, you see a shift in what people are covered by in terms of insurance. And so this just gives you a, an indication. This is 2008 to 2009. Um, so as the unemployment rate rose 2.8%, um, the decrease in employed uh, people covered by employer-sponsored insurance went down 6.9%. Um, and then you saw corresponding increases in our social programs covering people. Um, they're not perfect numbers. They're not perfect matchups. There are people that actually fall through the cracks. So they'll lose insurance under an employer model, and they will not be eligible for insurance under the social programs, under the federal social programs and state social programs. The Affordable Care Act was designed to address some of this problem, but even in its initial format, um, perfectly enacted, um, it only was designed to cover about 32 million people uh, when fully implemented. Remember, the implementation for the Affordable Care Act is a phased-in implementation, so it wasn't sort of an automatic everybody covered at once. But the idea was once fully implemented, it would cover 32 million people. So it was never actually designed to cover everybody uninsured. There was still an acknowledgment that there would be a significant portion of the population that did not remain eligible or was not eligible for any of the plans that were out there and may not have had access to either affordable private insurance um, or just access to any insurance at all due to some other kinds of uh, issues, say pre-existing conditions or other things that were going on. Um, the Act actually, uh, among other things, has some fairly clear exclusions, one of which was for undocumented in immigrants. This has caused a great deal of difficulty for some of our hospitals. Um, the hospitals themselves are still obliged to treat anybody who comes into their emergency room. So the federal requirements about treating people who show up in your emergency rooms, or at least stabilizing people who show up in your emergency rooms, do not make exclusions for undocumented immigrants. In fact, they don't talk about documentation at all. And so one of the difficulties that people pointed out with the very clear exclusion in the Affordable Care Act 
was the tension that it caused for hospitals who may be seeing increasing numbers of these populations. By the way, you might be surprised to know sort of who gets some of this stress. I mean, some of the obvious places, right? Florida is going to be dealing with this. Texas is going to be dealing with this. Cleveland deals with this too. Um, there are other states that have high immigrant populations and some undocumented immigrant populations who are struggling with the fact that they're seeing people show up in emergency rooms that they're being, hospitals are being required to provide at least basic stabilizing care for, um, but we have no programs out there that are covering these individuals. Um, as you know, we've also had a number of debates about the individual mandate. Even in its initial setup, it was designed to have uh, certain exceptions. Um, there were uh, people who were accepted, uh, accepted based on the fact that this would basically cost too much for them under the initial terms of the program. They could show that this was going to cost too much of their income to participate. Um, they had religious uh, reasons for exempting out. And then the penalties themselves were very limited and may, in fact, be even more limited in light of the Supreme Court's opinion. So what you could do to somebody who just says, nice law, I'm not following it, I'm not going to go ahead and buy anything here, um, has always been very limited, even under the initial iteration of the law, and in fact now is likely to remain quite limited. And of course, a number of legal challenges, decisions about funding, repeal, and changes. The legal challenges haven't gone away. We've decided uh, at least one of them, obviously, at the Supreme Court level. But there are many other things that are still making their way through the courts and a number of other challenges we're likely to see on details. Funding itself has always been a question. Um, we are likely to obviously see it funded under the continuing Obama administration, um, but exactly how it gets funded has been a question. And even the Obama administration actually wound up backing off um, over the past four years over certain aspects of the Affordable Care Act that when they tried to implement, they discovered were simply going to be too expensive, that they could not do what they had hoped to do. So it's not as if it was a very clear cut you know, one party saying we're not funding and the other party saying we are funding. It is, in theory, um, on the table in the discussions about the so-termed fiscal cliff. Um, most indications say it's unlikely to be changed in any way, shape, or form, but it's part of the rhetoric that's going flying back and forth on uh, what kinds of things are on the table for cuts. There are still discussions about repeal. That seems more and more unlikely, um, particularly as it becomes implemented. The effort it would take to repeal something like this would be enormous. Uh, for those of you interested in history or those of you who followed this uh, at the time of the Medicare-Medicaid passage, these were the same kinds of things that were discussed. So when Medicare was passed and when Medicaid was passed, um, there was an enormous uproar. There was a lot of discussion about repeal, a lot of discussion about how it would be funded, and then a series of discussions that followed in the years going uh, about how these would be implemented, what would happen. Um, the programs themselves, as you know, have really become part of the baseline expectations within society. I think we will see changes. Um, uh, we obviously have a back and forth going on right now. The latest. Um, uh, uh, Perry back uh, from the administration um, to the Republicans has been, um, who said that we need to make sure that we have cuts to both Medicaid and Medicare. The response back has been Medicaid is off the table, Medicare still remains on the table. I think all of that is sort of a political back and forth. There's no question that both programs and the expansions under the Affordable Care Act all remain on the table. So how we're going to see this play out is not entirely clear. Um, and like I said, there's likely to be changes going forward. Why? Because it's a very complex, very long piece of legislation, uh, and the chances that we got it right the first time around that we tried to do this are pretty slim. We see changes in all of our major federal programs, and we'll see continued changes as we try to develop this. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, tax-exempt hospitals and how they play a role in this particular world that we're uh, looking at here. And I put a little question mark, the nation's safety net. So part of the question, I think, for us is, what role are tax-exempt hospitals supposed to play? We had this expectation that we have what's called a safety net. In other words, as a society, we've so far made a decision that we are not going to guarantee um, health care, access to health care, or insurance, which are three different kinds of things, um, to individuals within our society. Um, that is a position we've taken as a society with the understanding that, oh, but there's this safety net out there that will help. And it's important to keep in mind that we're not just talking about individuals who are uninsured completely. We are also talking about what we are likely to see a much, much larger proportion who are underinsured. So there are some people out there who have insurance, but the insurance isn't going to cover everything that they need or isn't going to come close to covering what they need, and they're not going to be able to afford to pay for the excess out of pocket. 
So what do we do with the tax-exempt hospitals um, uh, out there? What do we expect from them in this world? So part of this came up, um, uh, when I first started doing the project, part of this came up because of something that was happening uh, locally. So the Cleveland Clinic uh, is in a property tax battle with the city of Beechwood. Beechwood basically looked at one of their facilities and said, you know, you're not doing anything here that justifies your nonprofit status. We understand that it might justify it as a whole, as, an, uh, as a system, but this, this particular location doesn't have it. We have schools. We need money now. Granted, you might be not terribly sympathetic to the Beechwood school system. It does have a number of other kinds of funding sources. Um, there are, they're in nowhere near the same situation as the Cleveland School District, for example. But it's not unusual for a school district to come back, particularly at times where um, financially, economically, taxes aren't as high as you might have hoped and say, you're here, there's other businesses here, we think you should be paying us tax fees. We don't think that you should have tax-exempt status here. Tax-exempt status is decisions are made differently at the local, state, and federal levels. So the fact that Beechwood says, we don't think that you should maintain your tax-exempt status for us doesn't mean it changes the tax-exempt status at the state level or the federal level. It is, however, highly unusual for an organization, and I'm not sure if I'm aware of one that exists, for an organization who does not have federal tax-exempt status to get it down the other way. But local doesn't transfer up necessarily. National uh, decisions on tax-exempt status almost always transfer down. So Beachwood's decision on this doesn't mean that the Cleveland Clinic loses its exempt status in any other municipality, the state, or at the federal level. So the back and forth battle currently actually um, is uh, sitting um, uh, uh, before the Tax Appeals Board. Um, so it's gone back and forth a few times. The city of Beachwood has won under certain circumstances. They're claiming that they now have at least $5 million in back taxes. This doesn't even count anything going forward. Um, the clinic continues to say this is not the case, that they, um, they uh, do meet all of their obligations, particularly as a hospital system. Um, and it's not clear where this is going to go. But there's large amounts of money at stake. And so for municipalities who are sitting there saying, you know, school districts who are sitting there saying basically, you know, we think we should be getting more money, it's enough for them to have the battles. Um, and Beachwood's not the only one that's looking at these kinds of things. Um, they're not small amounts of money that we're talking about. It's not just the uh, localities that are having debates about this. Illinois has been one of the most active states on this. They actually pulled charitable stat uh, status and tax exemption from Northwestern Prentice and Edward Hospitals. I pulled this one in particular. Um, this is one of the academic medical centers, and it came as quite a shock to the community that, in fact, not only were we talking about um, some of the hospital systems uh, that function in the various different areas, but we might even be talking about the academic medical centers being told, no, you're not meeting the requirements that we think you should be meeting as a locality to maintain your tax-exempt status. Uh, so this one was a pretty high-profile case. Like I said, Illinois was actually pretty aggressive against a number of hospital systems, basically reviewing them and saying, no, we think you should be paying state taxes. Uh, at the same time as all of this is going on, there's another front that this is a battle on. So uh, there's a class action, there are class action lawsuits that are being brought and individual lawsuits being brought against hospitals for what are called aggressive debt collection practices. And so essentially this is kind of the other front, right? The localities and the states are clearly saying, you know what, we don't have a lot of money right now, we'd really like to get your property taxes rather than maintain your tax exempt status. Um, at the same time, the individuals who are being seen in some of these institutions are saying, you know what, you're not acting a lot like a tax exempt or a charitable hospital. Um, and I'll explain a little while why I don't think those things are, uh, mean the same thing. But you're not acting like we think you should act. Um, we, are being, we are getting stuck in these situations, individuals now saying we're getting stuck in situations where we've gotten care and then we've been told basically, um, you know, here's your bill, and all of a sudden it gets sent to a debt collector, a very aggressive debt collector, and they're garnishing wages, they're trying to put liens on their house, they're trying to do all sorts of things that you kind of expect in the context of, you know, you didn't pay your car, you kind of expect maybe in the context of you didn't pay for the new TV you bought, but maybe you don't expect in the context of, you know, you got an emergency um, uh, operation and now the hospital's actually coming after you with very aggressive debt collection practices. This has been uh, such a concern that a number of them have actually brought lawsuits. They're moving forward at different rates in different places. Uh, interestingly, the uh, early ones of these were bought, brought by Richard Scruggs. Everybody know who he is? What's his other really high-profile case he brought? Anybody have an idea? Yeah. 
This is the guy that sued the tobacco companies. So in his mind, this was the same kind of thing. These were these evil, awful corporations. Here now, tax-exempt hospitals. That's a really interesting concept. Um, and he had a lot of support for people who basically said, yeah, these are awful, evil kind of you know, entities. But the idea that you start to equate some of these places with large tobacco companies is really kind of an amazing frame shift in our understanding about the role that hospitals play within our society. Uh, Chuck Grassley has taken the lead at the federal level. He's been very, very interested, as he said, um, in uh, trying to find out what these uh, hospitals are doing to account for their tax-exempt status. So he's had multiple inquiries that he's spearheaded. Um, he's basically said, look, I think there's something fishy going on here. I don't know if you really should have this tax-exempt status. Remember, all these are different levels. So this is happening now here at the federal level. Um, I think that we should be looking more carefully at what you do to justify maintaining tax-exempt status. The IRS has jumped on board, too. Um, they've been doing surveys and reports trying to figure out what hospitals are, in fact, doing. Um, they found some interesting data. It does look like, in fact, um, uh, hospitals are um, engaging in the activities that you might want them to engage in, but with different degrees. Um, there are a smaller number of hospitals that are, in fact, providing higher levels of uh, uncompensated care back to the community to the extent we think that that's what they should be doing. Um, the um, uh, amount of money varies. Um, the total community benefit expenditures usually range somewhere between 6 and 9 percent of total revenues. Uh, again, they vary considerably from hospital to hospital, from hospital system to hospital system. Um, they also vary depending on what you decide is, in fact, a community benefit, and that's part of what we'll talk about today. All right, so uh, what are tax-exempt hospitals? Why do we even have this discussion about them? So first of all, just to note, I'm going to switch back and forth between the terms nonprofit or not-for-profit and tax-exempt. Technically, they are different things. Um, for our purposes, that those differences are not important. Um, so when I talk about a nonprofit or not-for-profit, what I'm talking, what I'm focused on is those which do have tax-exempt status at the federal, state, or local levels. What we are interested in, most of these um, are 501c3 uh, organizations. There are other kinds of tax-exempt status you can have, but the hospitals we're talking about are under this category. Um, they are usually exempt from, therefore, paying federal and state corporate income taxes, state and local property and sales taxes. This is the category that's debated by, say, Beachwood and the other localities. Um, they take and can take charitable donations. Uh, they can. They are eligible for federal research grants and some private foundation grants that require you to be a 501c3 organization. Um, and there's a big public image benefit. So lots of significant benefits come from this. And in fact, hospitals that have lost status have said, or are concerned about this, particularly at the federal level, have pointed out that it's not just the fact that they have to pay taxes at this point, but the fact that they couldn't then get charitable donations um, and that individuals wouldn't be able to write off those donations, assuming that that remains in our tax code, um, but that they also might lose federal research grants, they may not be eligible for various foundation grants, um, and many of these hospitals claim this is a big deal that they get to say, look, we are a nonprofit or not-for-profit. Hospitals don't usually advertise the tax-exempt part. They like the term. They'll advertise it as a, you know, we're a nonprofit or not-for-profit organization. Um, but what they're really banking on is this tax-exempt status and what its effect is on their image. Oh, they went away. Hmm. I have the ability to do it today. Hmm. I'm having a bad Wednesday. Maybe it's that 12-12-12 issue. It was really weird to realize it was 12, 12, 12. I feel like I should be doing something very significant today. Like, the end of the world <laughs> is clearly not here. <laughs> but, you know. Um, OK. All right, so. Um, oops. OK. Um, all right, so uh, talk for just a second about what you are required to do. Um, so Internal Revenue Ruling 69.545 sets out what you have to do to um, maintain your tax-exempt status, essentially. Um, anything striking about this particular list? Yes. 
Anything missing? Um, it doesn't say anything about uh, making a profit, right? It also doesn't say anything about charity care. It actually says, when it talks about paying it all, that you can charge people. It just says, if you're not providing emergency room services, you can, you know, pay, charge people for them. Um, that's actually rather striking, right? So why in the world do we have this whole huge focus on charity care? The Internal Revenue Ruling really doesn't say something like provide charity care. Um, so where does this come from? Um, in fact, what it comes from is other guidance documents from the Internal Revenue Service. So if you look at the hospital reporting forms, um, one of the primary things they ask for in trying to figure out whether or not you are meeting what they call your community benefit standard um, is the amount of charity care that you've provided. What kinds of uncompensated care have you provided? So we have the signals other places. Now this is interesting. So the, the community benefit requirement, this, this particular standard here, came about in light of the passage of Medicare and Medicaid, when hospital systems actually were very concerned that with the passage of the new statutes, there would not be enough charity care that they could provide to make that an appropriate standard. So the previous standard was called um, the best of your financial ability standard, or essentially provide care, uh, uncompensated care, to the best of your financial ability. And hospitals said, this is kind of scary to us now that you're passing all this wonderful federal legislation. We don't think there'll be enough charity care need. We have to be able to count other things to maintain our tax exempt status. And that's where the community benefit standard came about. There's an irony here, right? One is, of course, that we by no means covered all of the people and obviated the need for charity care. Um, but the other is that the whole point of this standard was to move us away possibly from looking at charity care or uncompensated care. And in fact, that's been almost the sole focus of a lot of systems for a long time. The uh, reporting form does include other kinds of things. So it's not as if the only activity you look at is uncompensated care, but it's listed as number one and it's clearly the primary focus of a lot of these organizations. Okay, so community benefit itself, what is it and what is it supposed to mean? It used to be the assumption that just creating the hospital itself was a community benefit. So there's some benefit to the community in having a hospital there. Um, now the issue is really whether or not these nonprofit organizations or not for-profit organizations provide benefits that aren't provided by a for-profit. Because the truth is, the for-profit organizations do a lot of this too. They do, in fact, provide uncompensated care. They do, in fact, uh, take on a variety of bad debt. Um, they do a lot of the kinds of things you see in the not-for-profit. So what's the difference? There are some differences. Some of the studies have showed that it's, um, uh, there are certain kinds of services, certain types of services that you are more likely to see in a not-for-profit organization, uh, hospital organization, than in a for-profit. So there are some units that, that tend to overall not make money at all. Um, that you are more likely to see in a not-for-profit organization than in a for-profit. Um, but the absolute numbers in terms of uncompensated care, there are very high numbers of uncompensated care provided by the for-profit for hospital systems. And our question here is sort of, what role is charity care really supposed to play in this community benefit? As I mentioned before, the IRS reporting forms, um, uh, the 990H, is, uh, puts a lot of emphasis on the notion of charity care. They want to know um, what kind of charity care have you provided or uncompensated care you've provided at cost, what kind of unreimbursed Medicaid, uh, and unreimbursed costs from other government programs. And then they do list a number of other kinds of things. So uh, other community health improvement activities, health professional education, subsidized health services, research can get counted into here, and then other kinds of uh, contributions to community groups. Um, they're also, uh, hospitals are also asked to describe things like um, what is your care policy, what is your unpaid, uh, uncompensated care policy, what is your fee sliding scale policy, and that's become more of interest in the last couple of years, um, what kinds of billing collection practices. We'll get into a few of those. So the first thing to note about this is some of the difficulty in trying to get these numbers. And this was part of why the interest uh, was prompted, particularly at the federal level. So Senator Grassley's interest in this, the IRS's interest in some of this, was the determination about what is a charity care cost. So if you are trying to figure out a charity care cost and you are an organization and trying to set out your numbers, your goal is likely to be to set your cost at the highest level you can set it at, right? So set it at what the number is that you would set as a sort of uh, 
ultimate level for people who don't have insurance, who haven't negotiated rates down, who you haven't you know, tried to figure out. It's not necessarily the cost to you of providing the care, but the cost as if it were on paper when you say, how much does the procedure cost? And you put a little number next to it. Those costs are rarely costs that are paid by individuals. We've known for a long time, for example, that the cost stuck to a procedure for an insured person is very different and significantly lower than the cost stuck to the procedure for an uninsured person. That doesn't mean the uninsured person necessarily pays that cost out of pocket, but that's the cost stuck to that procedure. What does that mean? It means that your charity care costs are not numbers that we can you know, necessarily say are in fact costs to the organization. Um, and that's been for a long time something that people have pushed on in trying to look at these numbers and understand them. Um, the other thing is that uh, charity care includes a, a amount of, significant amount of bad debt. Um, the notion of bad debt being a cost to the institution is not itself a problem. The difficulty is, is that the costs themselves are set up in such a way to accommodate for a certain amount of bad debt. So the question was, are you double counting if you both assume that you're going to have a certain amount of bad debt, set your costs to accommodate for that bad debt, but then count that bad debt once again as being something that you gave to the community back as a benefit. Um, the third category that was a concern was the Medicare and Medicaid shortfalls. Um, there were a couple things in this area uh, that people uh, were concerned about. One was that if you see a high proportion of Medicaid patients, you actually get what are called dish payments, disproportionate share payments. Um, and those were supposed to compensate you, compensate certain hospitals more than others who saw higher proportions of these patients. Those numbers were not discounted then again from the Medicare Medicaid shortfalls numbers. So again, concerns that you were getting money in one place and maybe you know, getting it back in another place, but you weren't counting them the same way. Um, by the way, that's another area that's been a lot of concern right now because those payments are falling. And they're falling um, uh, under the Affordable Care Act with the understanding, initially the agreements to have those rates go down, were under the understanding that the Affordable Care Act would require everybody to have insurance and this insurance expanded insurance coverage would reduce the number of people who are basically being seen without the coverage. The difficulty right now is that with the current implementation system, with this setup that ha says basically to states, um, you can participate in the program and you can get this funding or you can choose to opt out of the program and not get the funding, there are going to be large, large numbers of people now who don't have the coverage or who have lesser coverage under what are going to be still very different Medicaids. I mean, the, I remember the idea behind the Affordable Care Act was to have a much more uniform Medicaid coverage across the board. Medicaid as a federal state system has always varied from state to state, but the concept was it would be a little more uniform across the different states and certain things would be automatically covered within the system. Um, we're going to still see some fairly significant differences. Even under the Affordable Care Act, there was likely to be a certain number of differences. We're still going to see fairly huge differences now, particularly as states might opt out completely under the expanded coverage. The federal government's position on it has been, if you opt out completely under the expanded coverage, we're not going to you know, sort of partially give you those funds. So the Supreme Court decision says you don't lose what you used to have. You're not going to make all Medicaid funds contingent but it's still allowing the federal government to make the new funds contingent. In other words, you can't sort of opt into the Affordable Care Act. You either opt into all of our expanded coverage or none of it. Under its initial terms, the federal government was paying for most of the expanded coverage. So it means that most people would have had coverage and would have had it quite expansively with most of it being borne by the federal government. The state's concerns were sort of like going forward, how long will this last, what are we going to have to pay? States who are opting not to use this are basically opting out of significant amounts of federal money. And there's a lot of concerns by the hospital systems that they're not going to see anything picking up that slack, so that they're actually going to be even more burdened now with what should have been expanded coverage, um, more people who are going to need more kinds of coverage of things and who are going to be both underinsured and uninsured. Um, OK, so uh, just my uh, sideline on kind of understanding where we're on this. Um, so concerns uh, in the charity care context that you, what the hospitals were basically counting was not all free care, not all um, things that they weren't getting some kind of compensation for, and a concern that, you know what, hospitals, for-profit hospitals were also providing this. So again, if your question is, why afford the tax-exempt status, 
you've got to look at what are you providing that the other places are not providing? What are you getting out of this? What's the trade-off that you're getting in lieu of the taxes? So when look, looking at this, I thought about this for a while. And um, one of the things I thought was a problem was our emphasis on charity care as being the one thing that these hospitals should be providing. And my suggestion was really that we should be shifting to think about hospitals providing what we call population health benefits to the communities in their function. And it doesn't mean that individual charity care was supposed to go away. It just meant that that shouldn't be your primary emphasis. If you had to think about why you maintain tax-exempt status, you should maintain it because you're providing population health benefits. And the goals were um, to think about the population as a whole. If you think about what are you doing, what's the trade-off in tax-exempt status? So basically the community says, look, in exchange for these tax revenues we're going to give up, we're going to get something back as a community. And my suggestion is that then I think we should be thinking very clearly about that as a community or population health issue, not as an aggregation of individual charity care. It's certainly a benefit to the community to have individuals get good health care. But that's not the only thing that you would look at if you look at population health. You're going to have to look more broadly at this. Um, the other thing to keep in mind here is that um, the idea is not to sort of say, well, I want hospitals to function as public health agencies. I don't want them to. There's many things that I don't think hospitals are going to be very good at at all that are things that public health agencies do. I'd rather see public health agencies do what they're doing well. But there are some things that hospitals can be good at. And in fact, even the individual care model was really not necessarily of great benefit to the individuals. So it almost never dealt with follow-up or long-term care. That's been a gap in our system for a long time. Um, it didn't do well for chronic conditions. So the care that was provided in the uncompensated care area was usually acute care. And again, that is a benefit to the community. But that may not be what you're looking for overall. That may not be the best goal and what you're hoping to get in exchange for giving up these tax revenues. Remember, everything's a balance. From the community's perspective, you might say, just give us the money. We'll take it and use it to do what we think is best for our community's health. So it always has to be the balance back and forth. The other thing about population health benefits that I wanted to stress is that I do think that we should be looking at outcomes. And this is something that the charity, individual charity care model doesn't allow us to do. So the individual charity care model basically says, what did you pay? What did it cost you? And I remember we talked a bit about why the cost model might be problematic. But what did it cost you to provide this? The population health benefit model is going to say, what kind of benefit did you produce for the committee? Not what did you pay out, but what kind of benefit did you see? And I think this means that you have to have a number of things shift a little bit in order to get this to implement. Um, so uh, benefits of going uh, this particular route, uh, it might avoid some of the problematic incentives. So it might, if you're not looking at how much you paid out, you might get less of an incentive to play around with those numbers to make them look as large as possible. Um, I think it has some practical benefits. Public health uh, is sadly underfunded and has been for a very long time. Um, and I also think that conceptually better fit. I mean, I think this is part of what we tried to do in the first place in creating a community benefit standard. And I think this makes much more sense. If a community is giving up tax revenues, the community should be getting the benefit, not necessarily the aggregation of individuals within that community. So it's not just that you add up, well, you know, these 20, 30, 50, 100 people got these particular benefits in the community. Um, it's, I think it makes much more sense to be thinking about it on a community as a whole level. The very first things you need to do are pretty simple. Um, one is just to change a bit of the IRS reporting forms to emphasize different things. I think it's no mistake. When you put something as number one in your IRS reporting forms, that's what your organizations are going to focus on. And we've seen that consistently. Uh, so I think one of the things that uh, you could think about doing here is you can basically, and this does not require legislation, um, although it does require regulatory changes, which can be as aggravating or as long-term an, an effort to try to get through, um, it does require changes to the IRS reporting forms and thinking about what kinds of things you emphasize in the forms. We're already seeing changes. Um, in fact, uh, we're due to see um, probably some uh, latest changes um, anytime, probably not quite before the end of the year, um, but possibly, um, and if not, probably into January in our last um, efforts at uh, the IRS um, Schedule H. Um, the other thing I think you might consider putting in place here is what I call a community benefit board. Um, and I don't think it's the same as a hospital board. 
I think the concept here is that you would create a board that would be able to identify and prioritize the population health needs within a community. So you would have community representatives on it, you would have hospital representatives on it. Um, I do think that you could think about this in terms of geographic communities, although I acknowledge that that can be limiting in trying to understand the role of geographic communities. Um, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, we all benefit, um, you know, Beachwood, for example, benefits from having hospital systems located in the city of Cleveland. They're really not a little autonomous suburb. So you have to be careful in understanding your geographic boundary lines. Uh, we don't, you know, Beachwood wouldn't probably exist but for the fact that the city of Cleveland still does exist. We know this when we try to understand a lot of other economic issues about our suburbs and the relationship with the city. Healthcare is no different. Um, you have to, you know, think about your communities in varying terms and you have to understand that there's overlap. Uh, but I do think that a community benefit board can uh, serve an important purpose. We use them in other places. Uh, when we convert a for-profit hospital to a not-for-profit hospital, we create a type of community benefit board that actually oversees the distributions of the assets from the not-for-profit, saying whether or not those assets are being used in a way to benefit the community. So it's not a bizarre concept. We do use this idea in other areas, and I think it would be beneficial here to try to understand what the hospitals could be doing. Uh, and the other thing is I do think you need to play around a little bit with the mechanisms we use to evaluate community benefit. Um, so here I think that we should be looking much more, as I said earlier, on outcomes, not what you paid in, but on what you're getting out. And I acknowledge that this is not an easy part of this, and this is probably in some ways the most difficult thing to implement in this. There are traditional public health tools that you can try to figure out um, and use to evaluate and quantify be benefit. So, um, Typical things we use in public health, you can look at measurements of participation rates in a program, uh, behavior after the program, health status after a program, sickness care utilizations or expenditures, uh, statistical lives saved, lack of pain and suffering, gains in productivity, risk reduction. All of these things in a public health context we play with and we put numbers next to and we get amounts. So it's not as if we haven't tried to figure out the, say, monetary cost or amount of a benefit. The only thing we have to keep in mind is that it's not easy, but it can be done. So, you know, it's sort of a frame shift, not just what you've put into the program, what kind of benefit did you get out of the program? What kinds of things might you use? And I give you just a few really easy examples here. Um, you might have free flu shots. You can uh, look at the number of people who are immunized, number of people who are high risk immunized, number who show a response, number who are exposed but show neither clinical or subclinical disease. These are things you can count in a community. We, by the way, keep a lot of these statistics already. And in fact, some of these things I suggest hospitals themselves already keep statistics on. Um, not necessarily on this one, but when they implement programs, it's very common for a hospital to keep track of how beneficial the program is. So it's not numbers that are coming from sort of nowhere. You can quantify things like um, the monetary value of fewer physician visits, fewer days of work lost um, because of illness, uh, the deaths avoided, um, you can look at cost of, life, uh, cost of years of life saved or cost of injuries avoided. Um, these are all kinds of things you can actually measure within a community. The last is really the uh, proportion of disease that would be eliminated if the causal factor is eliminated. So that, again, you can actually get numbers to put with this that you can use in reporting what kind of benefit you have. It's not a perfect solution. Um, one of the concerns in the individual charity care model is gaming the system. I think there are concerns like that here. The concern in the individual care model is that you're going to sort of drive your numbers up, say what something costs as high as you can make it cost, so that the numbers look much higher. Um, this also has problems. Uh, there's some concern about whether or not you can distinguish between a marketing initiative and a community benefit program, right? Come into our hospital so we can screen you for high cholesterol and then direct you to come and get the care in this particular way. Is it a marketing initiative or a community benefit program? It's probably a little bit of both. Um, so, you know, how do you, how do you count that? How are you supposed to think about that from a benefit standard? Um, measuring outcomes can be difficult. In some ways, it's harder than measuring monetary outlays because you can at least say, this is how much money I spent. I can play with those numbers and the amount that you spent, but at least you have that to start with. Here you're going to say, what's the outcome? And the outcome will vary over time. Um, and this is also part of the difficulty here. I think that to do this well, we may need to sit, shift away from a yearly reporting system. So the hugest burden on tax-exempt hospitals right now is the annual reporting 
the um, idea is that in, uh, if you shift to this kind of a model, you might have to shift to multi-year reporting. We do that in a lot of other tax areas, but that's because your outcomes are not likely to show up yearly. So your outlays might be yearly, but your outcomes may be two years, three years, or more down the road. All right. Oh, don't die on me again. You died on me again. Just before my picture slides, all the fun stuff. Let's see if it comes back on. All right, so what are we doing now? Um, let's see if I can get it to show me anything. Not yet. Um, OK, so some of the things we're doing now. First of all, the Affordable Care Act has looked at some of these uh, issues, um, and some things did change. So um, there are limits to how much you can charge, uh, what kinds of things you can list for uncompensated care. The charges are limited to the amounts that are generally billed to insured patients. In other words, you can't play with the numbers quite as much. Limits to extraordinary collection actions, and then hospitals are required to have a financial assistance policy. But the most important thing that it actually put in place was the requirement to do a community needs assessment. These were assessments that have to be done every three years, and the penalty is a $50,000 fine or possible loss of exemption of tax exempt status, which is actually a much bigger penalty than a $50,000 fine. This started up this year, the requirements for community needs assessment. Um, right now, as of November, the IRS identified a little over 3,000 tax exempt hospitals whose community benefit activities will be reviewed to see if they're meeting requirements. So they're going to take a look at these. Um, hospitals are not going to be notified if they're being reviewed, and they're not going to know when the reviews begin or end. So the IRS is going to do this behind the scenes. Enormous amount of concern from the hospitals in saying, you haven't exactly told us what it is we're doing or doing right. Are you going to come back to us and give us a chance to fix something if we're not doing something right? Are there going to be intermediate penalties? Or are you just going to kind of come back to us and say, oh, by the way, you lost your tax exempt status. You know, good luck with it next time around. Um, so nobody knows exactly what's happening with this. And so you can understand there's an enormous amount of concern about how that's working. Still no luck. <laughs> I was hoping I would get this to come back up so I can show you things. Oh, interesting. Maybe slowly. Um, some of the other things that were a big issue here for uh, the hospitals themselves is who looks at these things. So as we look at the um, IRS guidances that came over the last few months here, what you find is um, hospitals were first told that every single hospital in the system has to do this. That was clarified to point out that the system can do this. Each hospital will have to have this done, but you can be using the same kinds of data. So you can actually do this as a system. This is a big, important question, right? So if you're the Cleveland Clinic and you're trying to figure out what your community needs are, do you have to do a separate community needs assessment for Beechwood, for your Beechwood facility? Or can you do a more broad community needs assessment and do a more broad um, uh, focus on what you're doing for the community as a whole? Uh, so. The answer is, well, each hospital has to do them, but they can sort of look the same within a hospital system. Um, so you don't have to repeat things. Uh, the community, according to the IRS, has to be a geographic community. Again, they don't tell you exactly how small or large that geographic community is going to be, but that's what they're looking at. Um, uh, the effective date was March. As I said, as of November, the IRS has sort of said, OK, we're going to start looking at this. Um, but it's not entirely clear how every piece of this will roll out in implementation. It does note that you have to take input from persons who represent a broad interest of the community served by the hospital facility. What this means is unclear. I suggest that it should be some kind of benef community benefit board that's created, but this kind of a question has not been answered with any degree of specificity. Um, and you have to make your results widely available to the public, so you're going to have to get them out there somehow. There are regulations proposed, um, but none of them have really given us specific guidance on this community health needs assessments or the details on penalties for noncompliance. And that's been the areas that have been of the most concern. 
States have done a bunch of things in these areas. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but most of them have focused on modeling various kinds of community benefit requirements, some of them with more specificity than others, some of them, in fact, listing out, here are all the things we think could be a community benefit. Um, we haven't, as I said, seen that on the federal level, um, and we haven't seen that on any other localities level. Um, just to note, so Illinois, who was so very um, active in pulling tax-exempt status from hospitals, had a very huge lobbying effort aimed at passing legislation, which did in fact get passed this summer, um, that basically preserved nonprofit hospitals' tax-exempt status and expanded the definition of charity care to include things like preventative care in the community. Um, so the sort of pushback from the hospitals against their actions, against the action of the uh, state in pulling the tax exempt status, was to get legislation passed that ensured that they could maintain their tax exempt status. So we're seeing the battle kind of go back and forth there. What are we likely to see going forward? Um, I think financial viability is still a significant concern. I think it's a concern for all the reasons we talked about in terms of the limitations of the Affordable Care Act, in terms of some of the pressures the hospitals are getting. And to tell the truth, I mean, for all our battles against these hospitals and thinking about them, they provide an enormous service to the community. They're not, it's not that I really think that we should be equating them with tobacco companies. I think there's something kind of wrong with our notions of what's going on in there and our understanding about how we're supposed to deal with these things and our expectations from these hospitals. Um, I do think it's interesting about where we're seeing kind of these pressures for financial uh, viability come about. This is actually a, um, a article on uh, hospitals that have started advertising on billboards for ER patients. Um, you don't advertise for people who are in emergencies, right? So if you are having an emergency situation, you're taken to the closest hospital um, that wherever you are, where they can take you in and, and get you the care that you need. And you're sometimes diverted for various reasons, um, hopefully not for financial reasons. Um, uh, that's supposed to be blocked by other federal legislation. But in any event, advertisements are advertisements for people with non-emergent conditions. They have to be. So essentially what they're sort of saying is, come here you know, for something that you probably could have gone to urgent care for, maybe you could have gone to your doctor, or maybe you just could have waited until everything opened the next day, but come here because you won't have a wait. And those are ways to make money for a hospital. It's a very interesting kind of concept about the use of an emergency room. Um, the other thing that's been very, uh, very concerned is that um, the parts of the Affordable Care Act that are working and are expanding to people are some concern that you're actually going to get a whole bunch of other people um, on Medicaid coming in and using your hospital system, um, and you might not have the physicians and the staff to deal with them. Um, we are expecting about 30 million new patients over the next decade and about a shortage of 160,000 physicians by 2025. Um, and there's nothing that shows that we're going to catch up even if we try to expand drastically medical school admissions, which there's no indication that we're doing. So we aren't seeing, um, we may not have the capacity even in place to do some of the things we need to do. Uh, health insurance premiums are increasing, workers' contributions are increasing even more, and these are lines that actually give you um, workers' earnings uh, along the bottom. The very low one is overall inflation. The next line up are workers' earnings. The two high lines are workers' contributions to premiums and health insurance premiums themselves. So to give you an idea, people are paying more. These are huge burdens, which means we're likely to see more people what you'd call underinsured, more people who are going to basically say, I can't afford the level of insurance I've got so far. I'm going to have to drop how, how much my insurance covers in order to meet this because my wages aren't making, aren't kind of uh, holding the line with this. I'm getting charged much more of my salary to do this. There's a lot of public confusion still out there. Um, the nation's still divided on the Affordable Care Act. Um, so it's kind of, you see the split between them uh, in terms of who thinks it's favorable or unfavorable and a bunch of people who don't know or refuse to answer. Um, <clears throat> the people who want it repealed has gone down a little bit uh, since the election. So we've seen a little bit of uh, a back off on that. Interestingly enough, four in 10 people thought the law was overturned by the Supreme Court or unsure. Um, so we have a significant portion of people who don't know. The data on this right before um, in the months leading up to the Supreme Court case, a whole bunch of people thought it had already been overturned um, and wasn't valid. So a large proportion of the population doesn't know what's going on, doesn't know that it exists, doesn't know what the Supreme Court said. 
Um, or by the way, about um, uh, one third of people think that the Affordable Care Act includes a provision for death panels. So it does not, just in case you, you're one of those. Um, it does not, it never has. Um, that's not something that exists in any way, shape, or form, even sort of a, you know, well, you could have thought this was a death panel. There's nothing in it about death panels. You know, you get somebody out there telling the public that there's or that's in it, you get a lot of people who believe that's in it. Um, <clears throat> six and ten aware that it upheld. Uh, and the rest is going to be up to a variety of organizations and institutions here. My little comic at the bottom is a big giant wave called the, the uninsured and a little hospital saying incoming. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll see action by Congress. We'll see action, um, likely uh, cases that will go through the court system at least, and some will probably get up to the Supreme Court again. We are likely to see changes in Medicare, which will have, make a difference again in all of these areas and understanding these things. Um, We've uh, settled the issue at least uh, on the near term for the election, um, but not sort of in the long term in terms of seeing where we're going to go on this. And I think we're likely to see quite a few more changes and quite a few more concerns. I went a little longer than I thought, but um, I'm sorry about that and our technical difficulties, but I do have time for questions, so yeah. Oh, and I think there's a um, mic that you have to be able to use. I have a problem with your use of the community benefit criterion to justify the tax exemption. It's from, you gave two examples, flu shots and screenings. I mean, the cost of those is so minimal. I don't, they seem like tokens. I don't know how they can justify giving up the, the oh, yeah. taxes which could be put towards the public health. Yeah, no, no, I, I don't mean you do those alone. Those are examples of individual, I don't think, you know, providing one person with charity care does it either. So it's, it's that you'd still have to have this at a particular level to justify the tax exemption. I'm just trying to give examples of what would some of those things look like as opposed to how does, what does one individual charity care case look like. So it's not that you would, these are the kinds of things. There can be a lot of different things that you can offer that will be a benefit to the community. Those, the kinds of things I want you to focus on are those things that are population health benefits, not just those things that are individual charity care. But you still have to reach a minimum level in order to justify these status. You can't be, well, you know, we had a really good year, you know, we had an open clinic and we took everyone's blood pressure. Um, so that's not going to suffice. Um, but I'd rather have you see you folk. I'd rather have a hospital focus on those things that the community needs, and it may not be those things at all. By the way, one of the reasons I think you should have a community benefit board is to start to say, what does the community think that it needs? What does the community think that it wants to provide that benefit? What does it prioritize? Um, I think that would be extraordinarily valuable in understanding. Now, the community needs assessment gets at that to some extent. So the requirement that you have to go out and see what does your community need. Your community may not need free flu shots. Um, it may not need blood pressure screenings. They're, it's not clear what your community needs until you go out there and try to figure out what it needs. Yeah. Does what doctors and nurses and physicians assistants and staff do on their own time count? Um, no, unless it's the hospital is putting on the program and has asked them to, you know, those individuals to um, participate in it for their program. So it's not as if you're counting well, they volunteered their time at something else. But the hospital might put on something or do something and say, you know, to their staff, are you willing to volunteer your time for this? Um, in the name of the hospital. In the name of the hospital. Wearing it, your badge. It's still, right. It still has to be the hospital doing this. Um, now, there's other things that are going to limit their ability to talk to their staff and get them to give, you know, lots of free time. So there are employment things that are going to come into play here. Um, but, no, uh, technically it's not just what the individual staff that does, does not in order to the benefit of the nonprofit. Correct. Tax exempt status. Correct. Okay. That you don't count that. Thank you. Uh, hi. With the greater consolidation with hospitals, how important is the prior tax status of the entity in the consideration of future uh, uh, the future tax status? So, for instance, in uh, Beechwood, that had been a, I believe, a Mount Sinai facility. Uh, did the clinic just? Uh, accept that or are they, uh, are they arguing that their status has totally changed? Um, so far it hasn't made a huge difference in that. I mean it, what they're looking at is what is what is that being used for now is essentially what's going on and what is the organization as a whole. Now some municipalities um, 
are certainly looking at this more on a system level. So they're just sort of assuming. And I should say, historically, there was this assumption that if you had federal tax exempt status, you pretty much had state and local. It was rare for them to push. I think what's happened is that the states and localities have said, you know, we need more money. And you know what? We're looking at you and saying, yeah, we understand you're tax exempt on the federal level. As a whole system, you are. But this, in, this lo you know, location you've got doesn't look like you're doing what we think we want it to be doing. We'd rather you just give us the tax revenue and use it for what we want. So it's been a newer thing at all to kind of push. Now, newer meaning the last decade. What will happen going forward from here? Um, nobody's uh, indicated that with any great deal of specificity, right? So the, the Beechwood case, actually, um, there has been, there are standards that were articulated, and the clinic's position is we're meeting those standards, so it's pretty clear to us that we should maintain our tax exempt status. Beechwood's position has been we get to make that decision, no one else does, and our decision was you aren't. So, uh, you know, it's not, these aren't easy. And remember, when there isn't money around, everyone's going to be looking at this and saying these are large amounts of money, we're going to battle it out over them. From the IRS standpoint, do you have any clue what the percentage of audits uh, is on this? I mean, is it comparable to what they're doing tax, high-end taxpayers? I don't know. You know, they don't release that. That's the problem is they won't tell you that. They told us that there's, um, I think their number was 3,377 um, organizations that they currently have up for review. But they won't tell those organizations. They won't tell us what those are. They're not going to tell us when they're starting or finishing. Does that mean... They're going to look at them and it's going to take a day, a week, a month. Are they reviewed for a year? Is that just this year or next year? They're, going to, they're always very cagey about that kind of stuff. Um, and they haven't really answered what they're going to do if they find a problem, um, which is what's making a lot of the hospitals very, very nervous, right? If you find a problem, are they going to come back to you and say, here's a problem, let's work on it? Or are they going to come back to you and say, oh, no, we're rejecting this? Um, so, And that, um, even much more so than the local and the state issues, the federal issue has been a real concern. Other questions? years ago about community hospitals and poor neighborhoods actually going out of business because they were overwhelmed by the average of $800,000 to treat a bullet-ridden drug dealer. Do hospitals have the ability to turn people like that away to stay solvent? Yeah, not if they have an emergency room. If you have an emergency room, um, you have to have the emergency room open to all. This has been what the hospitals are saying. You got us on both ends, really? Like you're not going to give us any ability to deal with some of these things that we're dealing with? Um, you're going to just make us continue to... One of the reasons I actually thought about this uh, in, in writing this is one of the arguments I wanted to make is um, not that I think um, hospitals are, you know, evil organizations or anything, or that I think individuals shouldn't be able to get charity care when needed, but that I found it frustrating that as a societal level, our attitudes seem to be, let these hospitals just figure out how to deal with the things we haven't been willing to deal with as a society. Um, and I'd rather actually see us push away from that model and say to the hospitals realistically, no, as a society, we're going to deal with this. Here's what we're going to do. We're not expecting you just to pick up the slack. We don't have something called a safety net system. I mean, it's, an, it's an, an odd notion also, right? Our safety net system is basically to say to these organizations, OK, go for it. We have this need. Just do what you can. Unquestionably, hospitals have gone out of business, and some have closed their doors to emergency rooms um, and said, we just cannot do this anymore. We have no way to remain financially viable. Um, that's a problem. I mean, that's a societal problem. Other questions? All right, thank you guys so much.